I wanted to read this in blog TV, but never got a chance to. So I'm, I'm going to read it here. This is um, a portion of um, D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers. She herself was opposite. She had a curious, receptive mind, which found much pleasure and amusement in listening to other folk. She was clever in leading folk to talk. She loved ideas and was considered very intellectual. What she liked most of all was an argument on religion or philosophy or politics with some educated man. This she did not often enjoy, so she always had people tell her about themselves, finding her pleasure so. In her person, she was rather small and delicate with a large brow and dropping bunches of brown silk curls. Her blue eyes were very straight and honest and searching. She had the beautiful hands of the coppers. Her dress was always subdued. She wore dark blue silk with a peculiar silver chain of silver scallops. This and a heavy brooch of twisted gold was her only ornament. She was still perfectly intact, deeply religious, and full of beautiful candor. Walter Morell seemed melted away before her. She was to the minor that thing of mystery and fascination, a lady. When she spoke to him, it was with a southern pronunciation and a purity of English which thrilled him to hear. She watched him. He danced well, as if it were natural and joyous in him to dance. His grandfather was a French refugee who had married an English barmaid, if it had been a marriage. Gertrude Coppard watched the young miner as he danced, a certain subtle exultation like glamour in his movement, and his face the flower of his body, ruddy with tumbled black hair, and laughing alike whatever partner he bowed above. She thought him rather wonderful, never having met anyone like him. Her father was to her the type of all men, and George Coppard, proud in his bearing, handsome, and rather bitter, who preferred theology in reading, and who drew near in sympathy only to one man, the Apostle Paul, who was harsh in government and in familiarity ironic, who ignored all sensuous pleasure, he was very different from the minor. Gertrude herself was rather contemptuous of dancing. She had not the slightest inclination toward that accomplishment, and had never learned even a Roger de Coverley. She was Puritan, like her father, high-minded and really stern. Therefore, the dusky golden softness of this man's sensuous flame of life that flowed off his flesh like the flame from a candle, not baffled and gripped into incandescence by thought and spirit as her life was, seemed to her something wonderful beyond her. He came and bowed above her, a warmth radiated through her as if she had drunk wine. Now do come and have this one with me, he said caressively. It's easy, you know, I'm pining to see you dance. She had told him before that she could not dance. She glanced at his humility and smiled. Her smile was very beautiful. It moved the man so that he forgot everything. No, I won't dance, she said softly. Her words came clean and ringing. Not knowing what he was doing, he often did the right thing by instinct. He sat beside her, inclining reverentially. But you mustn't miss your dance, she reproved. Nay, I don't want to dance that. It's not one as I care about. Yet you invited me to it. He laughed very heartily at this. I never thought of that. Thought not long in taking the curl out of me. It was her turn to laugh quickly. You don't look as if you'd come much uncurled, she said. I'm like a pig's tail. I curl because I cannot help it, he laughed rather boisterously. And you are a miner, she exclaimed with surprise. Yes, I went down when I was ten. She looked at him in wondering dismay. When you were ten, and wasn't it very hard, she asked. You soon get used to it. You live like the mice and you pop out at night to see what's going on. 
It makes me feel blind, she frowned. Like a muda warp, he laughed. Yeah, and there's some chaps as does go round like muda warps. He thrust his face forward in the blind, snout-like way of a mole, seeming to sniff and peer for direction. They're done, though, he protested naively. I never see such a way they get in. But the man let me take thee down some time, and I can see for thy sin. She looked at him, startled. This was a new tract of life, suddenly opened before her. She realized the life of the miners, hundreds of them toiling below earth and coming up at evening. He seemed to her noble. He risked his life daily and with gaiety. She looked at him with a touch of appeal in her pure humility.